The third reading today I've chosen from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, and uh, I call it um, the Pregnant Early Church. And it's the, uh, the group of disciples and Mary and Jesus' brothers awaiting the Pentecost event. So it begins with the account of the Ascension. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. These are words inspired by God. So my two great childhood heroes were a guy called Christy Ring, who was a very famous hurler, for those of you who have seen the Irish game hurling. It's an ancient game that goes back to 1297 BCE. And Christy Ring was the, the, the great uh, expert in hurling. I saw him play many, many times. I never actually get, get, got to meet him. But my second childhood hero was uh, Bishop Cornelius Lucy of Cork. And uh, Cornelius Lucy, who was known popularly as, as Connie. Connie was a hero for a lot of Cork people. Connie was born in 1902, um, was ordained a priest in 1927, a brilliant, brilliant man. He then went to Innsbruck and did a PhD. Uh, and subsequently, he became the chair of philosophy and political theory in Minute University for about 20 years. And in his time, he was recognized as a, a world authority on social questions, and he served on government commissions on population and immigration uh, in Ireland. And he was ordained the Bishop of Cork in 1952. And then he worked as the Bishop of Cork until 1980, at which time he retired. And he came out to Kenya, and he wanted to spend the last years of his life in one of the toughest missions on the planet, uh, an area in northern Kenya called Turkana, a uh, complete desert area. But before he decided to settle there, he came out to Kenya and he visited all the Cork priests uh, in Kenya. So he spent a day with me. I was in a mission at the time called Kitura, and we spent the day together. And then he did his tour. He went back to Cork and he phoned my mother, Peg, and uh, my mother picks up the phone and she says, yes. And he, he had a very strange accent. He said, hello, Mrs. O'Leary. Uh, this is Bishop Lucy. And she says, yeah, and I'm Mother Teresa. And he said, no, 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 I'm absolutely deadly serious. I've been out in Kenya visiting with all the Cork priests, and I met your son, Sean, and I told him I'd give you a ring. And so he did. He went back to Kenya, and he spent the last few years of his life working in the desert in Turkana. In the course of his being a bishop in Cork, he built 13 new churches. But he's famous for what were called the Rosary of Churches. Between 1955 and 1962, he built five new churches. He knew exactly where the population was expanding into, you know, and what areas needed churches, and he was way ahead of the game. So in seven years, five new churches. And he, he was a brilliant genius at, at uh, finances as well. So he prevailed upon all the schools in Cork to start collecting newspapers and cardboard that could be recycled. 
And uh, a lot of the money for building these five churches came from newspapers and cardboard. So in Cork, we knew them as Connie's Paper Churches. And so the five great churches that he built between 1955 and 1962 were called the Rosary Churches. They were dedicated to the, um, the glorious mysteries of the Rosary. The, the resurrection, the ascension, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the assumption of Mary, and the coronation of Mary as Queen, Queen of Heaven. And so I want to take those as my theme today. Last week I spoke about the uh, joyful mysteries, and I unpacked those in my own fashion. And today I'm going to unpack the, uh, these five mysteries in my own uh, particular mystical understanding of it. So you've heard me deal with this topic many, many times. The first one is the resurrection of Christ. And I've spoken many times about what body resurrected. When you talked about Christ rising from the dead, what body are we talking about? And I've mentioned many times that uh, St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11 and in chapter 15, he deals with the notion of corporeality. And so in chapter 11, he's dealing with Eucharist. And in chapter 15, he's dealing with uh, resurrection. And so which body arose? Is there a man in heaven with nail holes in his hands and in his feet? Is that what we mean? So what do we mean by body? Because we're constantly changing our body. Every single month, you change every single skin cell in your body. 50% of the dust in your home is dead skin cells. Every six weeks, you change every single cell in your stomach lining. Every six months, you change every single cell in your skeletal system. And every seven years, you change every single cell in your body. And so if you were to imagine that a 30-year-old Christ resurrected you know, and went to heaven, every single one of Christ's 70 trillion cells had been borrowed from elsewhere. It was borrowed from flora and from fauna and from human folks. So at age 30, every single cell in his body was borrowed from other people or plants or other animals. And so what body is resurrecting and to whom does that body belong? And if at the end of the world, according to kind of strict fundamentalist Catholic thinking, at the last judgment, all the bodies rise from the dead, there's going to be absolute bedlam. Somebody's going to say, hey, buddy, you're wearing my kidney because we're all wearing cells that belonged to other people originally. So Paul is very clear. There are three words in Greek for the body. The first one is sarx, and sarx is this flesh stuff. And the second one is soma, which is kind of the energetic template of which the physical body is simply a hard copy or a printout. And then the third word in Greek is pneuma, and that's the spirit body. And so Paul says very definitely, sarx cannot inhabit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inhabit the kingdom of God. So when we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, what body are we talking about? I've spoken many times about the fact that every... Every soul is a holographic fractal of source. So you take this extraordinary fractal of source that had many incarnations, including an incarnation of Jesus in Nazareth, you know, and the body that is resurrecting, in a sense, is this holographic fractal, which is now shedding its corporeality, its sarxness, and it is ascending to higher and higher levels of identification with the self. So it becomes important then when we're talking about resurrection and the, the risen body of Jesus Christ, and when we're talking about Eucharist and receiving the body of Christ, we're not biting into Christ's big toe. We're having an encounter with a much, much higher level uh, of Jesus' personality, and it is a higher level of you that's having the encounter. So it's actually two holographic fractals of source uh, connecting with each other uh, through Eucharist. So the second uh, uh, glorious mystery then was the ascension, that Christ ascended into heaven. Traditionally, in most religions, there's a belief somehow that heaven is up. And that's absolutely wrong. If you're living in Australia, up is down. So it's not a question of upness. It's a question that heaven is an upper state of consciousness. When I was preaching in Swahili, I would say to the people, Binguni si mahali, bali nihali. Heaven is not a place, rather it's a state of consciousness. So the ascension represents the ascent into upper states of consciousness, a disidentification with our physicality, 
with our eth uh, kind of etheric bodies, with our astral bodies, with our mental bodies, with our psychic bodies, until finally we re-identify with the holographic fractal of source that we call our individual soul. So the ascension is the process of transition, the transition of consciousness through these various states. It's not about Christ kind of lifting off the ground, you know, kind of uh, uh, doing a Mike, Michael Jordan and floating off in, into the sky. So those who witness this ascension are witnessing a transition of consciousness. So there is a meeting between their own elevation of consciousness and the elevation of the Christ consciousness. That's what they're witnessing, you know, on the mountaintop. And it's on the mountaintop because symbolically, a mountaintop is the, it's the epitome of theophany. It's the great encounters with the divine always happen on mountaintops. The very first one perhaps recorded was Mount Ararat, where allegedly after the great flood, as the waters began to recede, the, the Ark of Noah came to, mount, to rest on the mountains of Ararat. So there was the theophany of God uh, being rediscovered by the human kind of uh, population that survived. We have Sinai and the giving of the uh, Torah uh, to Moses on Mount Sinai. We have uh, the Mount Tabor outside of Jerusalem where Jesus has his encounter several weeks before he died where he encounters Moses and Elijah in preparation for his own upcoming death. And the ascension story that we read of in the um, Acts of the Apostles takes place in the Mount of Olives, which was a mountain just outside of Jerusalem. So what does ascension represent then? It represents Christ's individual reversal of the descent into darkness and density of incarnation. That is what ascension means. It means Jesus who had plumbed the very, very depths of the, the darkness and the density of incarnation. And we are told actually in the Apostles' Creed, uh, during the three days when he was in the tomb, he descended into hell. He went as low as is possible into darkness and into density in order to kind of resurrect the incarnation itself. And so the, the ascension then for me represents Christ's individual reversal of that descent into darkness and density, uh, especially one in which the soul has forgotten its divine holographic fractal essence, which happens to most of us. So Christ represents that, um, that movement back from that plane of density and darkness and forgetfulness of our divinity back to who we really, really are. And so then in some senses, ascension represents the journey of remembering. I talked about that in some detail last night. Ultimately then, it is the very cosmos itself, remembering its divine origins and regathering into its original blueprint. I said a few weeks ago that I believe that, you know, after God had self-fractured into holographic fractals, the very first synod or the very first meeting between source and these fractals was the decision to create a cosmos. And indeed they did. That is how the cosmos came into being. Now, ascension represents that this very cosmos itself remembers its divine origins and is now regathering itself back into its original blueprint that was created at the first synod between the holographic fractals and source itself. So for me, that's what I mean when I talk about the ascension. The third glorious mystery then is the descent of the, the Holy Spirit. And there are two very, very different versions uh, of this, one in John's Gospel and one in Luke's Gospel. It's interesting that according to John's Gospel in John chapter 20, resurrection and Pentecost happen on the very same day. According to Luke, they're 50 days apart. According to Luke, there's resurrection, then there's 40 days and ascension, and then another 10 days, and there's Pentecost. According to John, they all happen on the same day. Because in some senses, you're not timing, you're not talking about time here. You're talking about the kaleidoscopic understanding of consciousness itself. And so John says that on the day of resurrection, Christ came into the upper room where the people are hiding and the door is locked. And he came through and they're scared. They think it's a ghost. And he said to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you. And then we were told he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. And so the sign of um, the Spirit is the breath of God. The very, very beginning in Genesis, we are told that God breathed life into this creature he created from the clay, this Adam. And so breath represents the Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself. So here's Pentecost happening right there on the day of resurrection. 
But then there's this extraordinary mistake that the Catholic Church has made over 2,000 years, that when Christ said, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. This idea somehow that the forgiveness of sins was a clerical privilege that you would go to have to go to a priest and confess your sins, and then he would say, ego te absolva peccatis tuis, I absolve you from your sins. Has nothing got to do with the clerical privilege. It is Christ saying that the hallmark and the mission of the reception of the Holy Spirit is your ability and your willingness to forgive the sins of others. And what he's saying is, it's both a psychological and a sociological phenomenon. If you forgive people their sins, there's a forgiveness breaks out and peace breaks out. If you hold on to the grudges, then war continues to break out on a regular basis. So we have within our, our own souls the ability to, to bind or to loose. This is not a, a clerical privilege. This is the hallmark and this is the mission you know, of, of having received the Holy Spirit. The fact that I'm willing to let go of any grudges I hold against anybody you know, and ask for forgiveness from, from people whom I have hurt. And the realization that sociologically and psychologically, I have this power in myself uh, to, to bind or to loose my own spirit and therefore to do it sociologically as well. Now, in the Pentecost event, then you have this symbol of tongues of fire and the extraordinary event where people, uh, Jews from all over the world who are gathered for their own feast of Pentecost are hearing the disciples speak in all their own languages, a pluriformity of tongues. So it's in some senses the very reversal of Babel when a guide in his jealousy, you know, divided the tongues of human beings so they couldn't understand each other. And now you have the reversal that we all speak the one language. It is the language of love. It is the logos of fire itself, that which purifies. And so in some senses, one movement within the Christian churches that really got it right was Pentecostalism. In spite of what, whatever you think about it, Pentecostalism had a real deep insight into what it means to be taken over by the Holy Spirit. There was a Catholic charismatic renewal that began in 1967 in Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, where the Catholics came alive to the notion of Pentecostalism and speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. I remember I was living in Tanzania in 1973. I was living in a little town called Tabora. I was in language school learning Kiswahili, and there was a seminary attached to it. And uh, I got involved with the Catholic charismatic renewal in the, in the seminary in Tabora in 1973. And for me, it proved to be one of the most uplifting spiritual and kind of metaphysical experiences of my life. I remember being back in Ireland in 1975, my first uh, vacation back from Kenya, being at a Catholic charismatic retreat in Dublin. And there were 5,000 people in this huge, huge big hall. And all of a sudden, spontaneously, people started singing in tongues. And this music went on, I would say, for maybe about seven minutes, just the most extraordinary mystical music I've ever heard. There was no conductor. There was nobody in charge in it. It was just light, like waves on an ocean with hundreds of different tongues being uttered at the same time and then tailing off and ending at the same split second. So this notion of the power of Pentecost is not something that belonged to those who lived 2,000 years ago, but it is available to anybody who opens themselves up to spirit. So that's the third uh, glorious mystery. In 1950, uh, Pope Pius XII declared the Feast of the Assumption of Mary. The notion that Mary's body, when she died, was taken uh, literally physically into heaven. Now I got things to say about that. But I was a member, so about 1960, I was involved in an organization in Ireland called the Legion of Mary. And uh, on the Feast of the Assumption, we had a big meeting uh, at Dillon's Cross uh, in Cork City, where there was a beautiful grotto to Mary. And I had the privilege of being allowed to lead one of the decades of the Rosary. And I was assigned the fourth decade of the Rosary, the Assumption of a Blessed Lady into Heaven. And for the first time in my life, I was given a microphone and I was told to announce and to lead the fourth glorious mystery. And I'm really nervous. And I start up and I start saying, uh, the, the, um, the, um, uh, the fourth uh, glorious mystery is the consumption of a blessed lady in heaven. And the whole crowd with the hysterics, of course. 
So that was my introduction to the to the assumption. Now we got the same notion if we agree to this idea somehow that the body of Mary is 70 or a 75 year old woman that when she died, she fell asleep and that physical body was taken up into heaven. And so which body ascended? Was it her 75 year old version? Was it her 30 year old version? Was it her 16 year old version? And again, if heaven is a place, where exactly is it located? If you're gonna take your physical body with you, there has to be some physical space to inhabit. So how far into space do you have to go? So how does she travel? Escape velocity from planet Earth is 25,000 miles per hour. To get anything out of the Earth trajectory, you've got to have an escape velocity of 25,000 miles an hour. So did somehow Mary manage to kind of hit the accelerator and get up to 26,000 miles an hour? And did she have some kind of a, a GPS system which allowed her to navigate the asteroid belt, this uh, belt between Mars and Jupiter, which is littered with asteroids and is really, really dangerous for any kind of space travel. And the truth is, has nothing got to do with these. The real meaning of the assumption is that the feminine is assuming its rightful place in mystical theology. That after 1,950 years, even the Catholic Church realized that there is a, there is a, a place in, in, the, in the Trinity uh, to make it a quaternity, that there's a place for the feminine face of God. Now, that wasn't their thinking, actually, but that's what they accomplished. So in some senses, it was the conjoining of the Greek notion of Theotokos, uh, uh, mother of God, or Sophia, or Tara within the Buddhist tradition, or Shekhina within the Jewish tradition, the feminine face of God that the assumption of Mary represents the fact that somehow after 1950 years, the notion finally permeated into the psyche of the Catholic Church that Mary, that the, the, uh, the energy of Mary was vital for the uh, energy of the divine, which leads me then to the, the final one, the coronation. And this, the coronation or the kind of um, uh, Mary queen of heaven, that was actually the church, the last of the five churches that Connie Lucy built. And he literally built it at the other side of my backyard fence, literally in my house in Mayfield, we had a back garden that ended with a chicken coop. And at the other side of the chicken coop was a fence. And at the other side of the fence was this uh, church number five, uh, the coronation of our blessed mother as queen of heaven. So I could literally jump my fence and go into that church. It was the first uh, church in which I said my first mass on the 5th of June in 1975. And it was the last Catholic church in Ireland that I said mass in on the 20th of November from my mother's funeral in 2010. But when the doctrine of the coronation, it was bad enough that the Catholic church was, was claiming that Mary was assumed into heaven, but now they're making her the queen of heaven. So the Protestants of Europe at this stage went absolutely crazy that the Catholic church had finally and completely lost its marbles. There was one huge exception, and that was Carl Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, the, I regard as probably the greatest psychologist of all time. He was ecstatic because he finally realized that you know, the ideal form is a mandala, uh, uh, which is symmetrical about two axes. And what he saw was that the Trinity had finally grown into a quaternity, that the feminine face of God had finally been recognized. And so this coronation ceremony, what does it mean then? that there's Father, Son, Spirit, and, and Sophia, or Theotokos, or, you know, or Tara, or Shekhinah. So I've defined the Holy Spirit in the past as, for me, the Holy Spirit is the divine womb in which embryonic Christ consciousness is marinated in the amniotic fluid of pure love. And so in some senses then, the Holy Spirit is the quintessential organ or the quintessential energy that receives the seed of the word of God, the Logos, and incarnates it. And so there's this uh, extraordinary cooperation between the Holy Spirit and Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she could receive this seed, uh, this Logos, into her a physical womb and incarnate what I consider to be the next phase of world redemption, that we've gone from forgetting who we are into beginning to remember again who we are, that we're uh, fractals, holographic fractals of source, and that Mary and Jesus and the Magdalene were the beginning of that movement. And so when I think of Mary being crowned queen of heaven, I don't imagine that the father has a crown in his hand and he uses it to Jesus and Jesus puts it in her hand and the Holy Spirit is clapping in the background. 
That is not what it means. It means somehow that uh, the coronation of Mary as Queen of Heaven is it's the fullest expression of the divine through the crown chakra. It's like the final stage of earth energy merging with human energy. If, if you use a Hindu model of the energies, it's the final, you know, meeting of the feminine and the masculine. So that's what I mean by the coronation for me, the final recognition of the reality of the meeting of earth energies with uh, uh, sky energies. I want to add a, an addendum today about women priests. It's really real painful to me that 2,000 years later, in spite of the assumption and in spite of the coronation, that women still can't be priests in the Roman Catholic Church. And I've, I imagined a scenario one time many years ago. It's a Sunday morning in Jerusalem in the year 35 AD. And Mother Mary gets on her phone or iPhone and she texts Mary Magdalene and she says, Mary, can you tell me where St. Peter is saying Mass today? And Mary Magdalene gives her directions and, her, you know, and uh, she finds her way to where Peter is saying Mass. And at the communion of the Mass, Mary, the two Marys kneel down very respectfully in front of Peter and Peter takes out a host. And he says, the body of Christ. So here is the man who denied Jesus, offering the body of Christ to the woman who conceived Christ, who carried Christ, who birthed Christ, and who breastfed Christ. And somehow she's the kind of humble recipient of the body of Christ from the man who denied him. It's amazing to me that 2,000 years later, that the church is still so blind that they cannot realize that it is woman who confers and gives the body of Christ in the first place. There are none so blind as those who will not see. My final point, I want to make a quick comment about the value and the failure of the Protestant Reformation. It's pertinent to this issue. The great gift of Protestantism in the 1500s, early 1500s, was to expose the extraordinary corruption of the Vatican, salvation for money, indulgences for sale. And they did an extraordinary job of overthrowing that. But they made three huge mistakes over the next hundred or so years. They abolished monasticism. They abolished mysticism. And they abolished Mariology, for the main part. There were some sects of Protestantism that held on to sola, some of those. And they focused on what they call sola scriptura, only this, this, the scriptures themselves. And they, there was a complete overemphasis on reason, on the application of reason to the word of God, and that, that was going to lead us to the truth. And it had a huge influence on three revolutions. Firstly, the scientific revolution, which had to do with developments in mathematics and physics and astronomy and biology and chemistry that transformed the views of society about nature. And that began in the year 1543. And then the second revolution was the Industrial Revolution that began in the year 1760, again with this extraordinary emphasis on, on ravishing the earth for its resources. And then thirdly, the Information Revolution that we're living in, a term that describes the radical changes that have been brought about by computer technology, you know, as storage and access to information, beginning in the 1980s. I would make the plea and the prayer today that our world desperately needs three new revolutions. It needs a monastic revolution, which gives us once again, true reverence for the earth and for human labor. This was the great gift of monasticism. You know, that they had this extraordinary reverence for the earth, they grew their own food, they made their own buildings, they cured themselves of their illnesses, and they had this total dedication to human labor. That's the first revolution we need to recover a real respect for planet Earth, and an understanding and a value of human labor. The second is a mystical revolution. The re-identification once more with the soul self, rather than the identification with the ego self. We need desperately again to realize, to start peeling off these layers of the self, to go from the, the ego, to the physical, to the etheric, to the astral, to the mental, to the psychic, until we once more go back to the holographic fractal of source that we are. And the third revolution is a Mariological revolution. 
the full integration of the truly feminine into the divine and into human affairs. Namaste, my brothers and sisters. <laughs>